have the most to lose, and therefore they are the most resistant to giving up their power to anyone else. And that is why they discriminate, it is said, against women more than anyone else does. I don't think much of any of those uh, arguments. And I think that I can help you to see a better explanation by looking at one of the other avenues that runs into the intersection of gender and technology. The one um, that uh, I've done a lot of research on myself. And that's the one that examines technological change and the impact of technological change on the unpaid work that in our culture and numerous other cultures is almost uniformly defined as women's work, otherwise known as housework. We don't ordinarily think about housework as being technological work, uh, but like all work it is. Um, I recently uh, listen to somebody go through the exercise with the class of making the class count the number of motors in the average kitchen. Um, actually, they were also then, this was a new, asked to count the number of microprocessors in the average kitchen. And as soon as you start doing that, it becomes immediately obvious to you that there really are technologies with which housework is done. There's been a lot of research about the house technologies with which housework is done in the last 15 years, some of it my own, but some of it done by other people. And there are a number of things, if I can summarize all that research very quickly for you, there are a number of things which I think it's fairly clear or that a lot of people who have examined this are willing to say are definitively true. The first is that there's been a profound change in the technologies, sorry, the technologies with which housework was done, is being done, in the developed countries in the 20th century. I once called it in an article, the industrial revolution in the home, and I think that most people would say that's a pretty fair description of what happened. A transition from, to be graphic about it, uh, hauling water out of wells and opening up a tap for it from chopping wood in order to create a fairly small amount of internal heat in a house to flipping on a switch for a thermostat from washing dishes by hand um, to putting dishes in a machine in order to be washed if any of those things had happened in any other workplace but the home, we would have called it an industrial revolution a long time ago. Um, and most people would now agree that in the 20th century, there was, in the developed countries, an industrial revolution in the home. Most Americans, experience, not all, but most, experienced that revolution sometime between, in the 40 years between 1920 and 1960. During that period of time, and this is one of the other things that most scholars who've looked at the subject pretty much agree on, during that period of time, between 1920 and 1960, there was no significant reduction in the time spent by women in doing housework. That was the conclusion that led to the title of my book, More Work for Mother. The time allotment to different jobs has changed. For example, in 19, and we know this in part, we know it for many different ways, but one of the ways we know it is from time studies done by home economists, some of them in aims of um, housewives going about their work. The time allotments of various jobs have changed. For example, though you may not believe it, it is nonetheless true, that women now spend much more time taking care of their children than women used to do in, let's say, 1910 or 1920. 
That's because there are all kinds of jobs related to children in 1990 that didn't exist in 1910. For example, transporting them places. People didn't take children places in 1910. Children either got there on their own feet or they didn't go. Um, and a large part of the time spent in childcare, if you go and look at this literature, which I did for 10 years, a large part of the time spent in childcare is spent in transportation. And that's what I mean when I say that the time spent in various job allotments has changed, but the overall time has not changed. According to the best data that we have, the average American housewife who was not full-time employed in the market in 1910, whether she was rural, or sorry, 1920, whether she was rural or urban, spent about 50 hours a week during, doing housework. And in 1980, the average American housewife who was not employed full time in the labor market, which was no longer the average American housewife, spent 48.2 hours doing housework. 50, it was 50 hours in uh, 1920, and it was 48.2 in 1980. And that's what I and others have meant by saying that the overall time spent in housework has not changed significantly despite the Industrial Revolution in the home. Productivity of housewives has changed a great deal because they produce a lot more for the time that they spent. A lot more clean laundry, for example. A lot more uh, balanced meals. Um, a lot more clean carpets. Larger square footage of bathrooms that are kept clean. Uh, but the time spent hasn't changed. Now, in the years since 1960, there's been a marked increase in the number of married women who are in the labor force full time, and particularly married women with children. Despite this, there has been, and this is the next to the last part of my conclusions about housework, there's been virtually no change in the amount of time that men spend doing housework until very recently. And then the change was very small. By very recently, I mean between 1980 and 1987, which was the last year for which I could find the data. Despite the Industrial Revolution in the home, which you might think would have made it possible um, for what had once been gendered work to become ungendered, because among other things, it was now being done by machines, and despite the fact that a more, way more than half, it's now up to about 80% of all married women are employed in the labor market, there's been virtually no change in the time that men spend doing housework. And furthermore, the work that men do is as gender segregated today in the home as it was in the past. Just as in the workplace, there are some jobs that are men's jobs and other jobs that are women's jobs, so too in the home. When home economists and sociologists go to look at what men, women, and children are doing in their homes, um, they discover that there are certain jobs that men do that are considered part of housework. Incidentally, housework is anything that's done without remuneration for, that is without pay, for the maintenance and sustenance of an individual or the individual's immediate co-residents. Can't say family anymore, uh, but the people with whom that person lives. Men mow the lawn, they take out the garbage. Those are, they paint, they do household repairs, they repair the car, that's all housework. You may not have thought of it as housework, but the sociologists categorize it as housework. Women cook, wash, and clean, take care of children. Um, and that's their housework. Um, there's a certain amount, but not very much, of gender neutrality when it comes to shopping. 
It is, there's been a little crossover in the supermarket, to put it uh, graphically. But by and large, uh, men's jobs are as segregated from women's jobs in the home as they are in the workplace. Now, why is that true? Well, many different answers have been given to that question also, and as the hour is drawing late, I'm not going to go through all of them. I've spent a lot of time doing research on that question, and what I'd like to end by telling you is that it seems to me, after looking at all the other possibilities, that the most likely reason why men don't do any more housework than they do has to do with what I and others call gender identity. From the time that we are in the womb, we are given, each of us, a gender identity. Those of you who have had children will know that the first question people ask about the bulge is, is it a girl or a boy? And these days, it's possible to know the answer to that question while it's still a bulge. Um, and an astonishingly large people, large people, large number of people want to know whether it is a boy or a girl before they even want to know whether it's healthy. And as soon as it becomes obvious whether it is a boy or a girl, um, our lives, whether we are boys or girls, uh, our lives become gendered. In the hospital, we get wrapped in a pink baby blanket or a blue baby blanket, and the little card on the nursery either has a pink bow on it or a blue bow on it, and there are some names that parents will give to boys and they won't give to girls and vice versa. You try to give the parents of a young boy, of, a, of an infant boy, a pink stretch suit to put on him, and I, you will immediately discover that even the most liberal of parents have gendered their baby early on. You can give a blue one to the parents and the daughters, but you can't, without getting raised eyebrows, give a pink one to the parents of sons. And when we are young, that is no longer infants, no longer in the womb or emerging from the womb, one of the most important questions we ask about ourselves, and I say this um, as someone who remembers her adolescence, though it was far too long ago, but also is the parent of adolescence now, um, one of the most important questions that adolescents have about themselves is, am I a real man or a real woman or a real girl or a real boy? And how do I know whether I am or not? And what is there out there in the world for me to imitate so that I will know whether I am really a girl or a boy, and what makes the difference between girls and boys. When you're the parent of growing children, you become immediately aware that self-identity for a child is very much wrapped up with gender identity. I should say, I'm going to say by way of digression, that having just finished writing a book on immigrants, I now know that this question is very much like the question that immigrants, young immigrant adolescents, ask themselves. My parents are Polish, Chinese, Iranian, Russian, whatever. But I am an American. How do I become an American? How do I know what an American is? What is there out there in the world that I can imitate? It's not my parents, because they're not. Immigrants ask, immigrant adolescents ask this question about being an American, or being whatever society they have landed in, British, Irish, French, or whatever. 
all young people I'm willing to propose, although I'm not enough of an anthropologist to know whether this is really true in other cultures, but at least in ours, it seems to me, all young people want to know about their gender. And all young people look to the outside world, outside themselves, for definitions of gender. And in this society, what answer does a young person get back? Interestingly enough, and maybe it's just me because I happen to be interested in technology, but it seems to me that a whole lot of the answers that we provide to young people have some technological connection to them. Real men don't cook. They don't sew. That is, it's work-related, and work is technology-related. Real men don't cook. They don't sew. They certainly don't nurse people. They don't eat quiche, as other people notice. Real women don't excel in calculus. They don't tinker with cars. They don't construct their own circuit cards, and they don't take drafting courses in high school. Young people search for models to imitate. And when the question they're asking is about gender, a whole lot of the answers that come back are work-related and technology-related. I put this uh, phenomenon a little bit more elegantly uh, in a piece I once wrote on the subject, and so I'm going to read my own words because I like them uh, to you. We socialize our men to aspire to feats of mastery, and we socialize our women to aspire to feats of submission. Men are hard, women are soft. Men are meant to conquer nature, women are meant to commune with it. Men are rational, women are irrational. Men are practical, women are impractical. Boys play with blocks, girls play with dolls. Men build, women inhabit. Men are active, women are passive. Men are good at mathematics, women are good at literature. If something is broken, daddy will fix it. If feelings are hurt, mommy will solve them. Salve them. <laughs> We've trained our women to opt out of the technological order as much, I wrote, as we have trained our men to opt into it. It's quite likely true, as I look up and down these roads and examine the intersection of gender and technology, that there may be a few biological differences between the brains of men and women, which account to some extent for why some men are super good at math and fewer women are super good at math. But you don't have to be super good at math to be a good engineer. You just have to be moderately good at it, and most women are. It may also be true that the explanation from class has some truth in it. Um, really is true that engineers on the whole tend to come from lower social class families than scientists do, and it really is true that girls who tend to excel in math um, or even to take math courses tend to be middle class, so maybe there's some truth in that explanation as well. I don't think there's much truth in the explanation that says that engineers are very powerful in this society. If you ask, say that to an engineer, what the engineer does is laugh and say, you have to be kidding. Lawyers are much more powerful than we are. Politicians are much more powerful than we are. Accountants are much more powerful than we are. And I think looking from the outside in, um, the engineers have a point. The seat of power in this society may be very diffuse, and engineers may have some of it, but they certainly haven't got more of it than other people have. And so I would suggest to you, as the end result of having looked down all these avenues, uh, where these two odd categories coincide or collide, um, that the more likely explanation for why there aren't very many women engineers and inventors coming down one road is revealed to us on the avenue where we don't see very, men, very many men 
making the effort to cook dinner, um, and that the answer is, and the reason for the one is, that our gender identities have been so wrapped up in the notion that if I do that work, I can't be really male or female, woman or man, that we have, as I put it, socialized our women to opt out of the technological order early in their lives. And then what happens, I think, as people grow older and they stop worrying so much about whether or not they're real men or real women, they've gotten too old in the case of the women, to be retrained to enter the technological professions. There is a point at which, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, you just can't learn as much as you once could. And unfortunately, um, for the affirmative action efforts of engineering schools, that point in our culture occurs after people, way after people, have stopped worrying about how to define themselves as real men or real women. So, by way of conclusion, let me say that what I find in the intersection where gender and technology intersect is far too many scholars and not enough young people. Far too many scholars who are studying technology and far too few women who are trying to do it. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah.